I'm David Matthews from Spark of Life. Our heartbeat is to walk beside those of you who are grieving, and this is our podcast number four, I think. And uh, we're on this kind of series of the CPR of a healthy grief recovery. And I know if you're watching this or listening, you've probably experienced some horrific losses in your life. Maybe that one big loss that happened recently or even 20 or 30 years ago. It could be a death loss or non-death loss. We want to give you some insight. We've worked with thousands of grievers since 2009 and actually way before that as well. And these grievers, those people who grieve, have taught us so much. And I know most of us have grieved in our lifetime. Some have horrific loss that maybe you're struggling to get through it and to find life and meaning again. And some of you have friends that have experienced loss. So we want to give you some uh, grief tips, uh, some insight to what we've learned. We don't know it all. And anybody who thinks they know it all, by the way, shy away from those guys, right? Shy away from them or those women because nobody knows it all. This is a messy road, this grief recovery. But our, our goal at Spark of Life is to give you hope, hope that though life can never be the same, after loss, life can still be rich and fulfilling and meaningful and even full of joy again. We've seen it happen in so many of those who have come and spent three or four days with us. We've done 107 grief recovery retreats all over the country. We're doing our first virtual retreat in September and go to sparkalife.org for that. But but in this podcast, we want to talk about the CPR of a healthy grief recovery. The C is context. And last week we talked about location, location, location in the real estate world being so important because of the things that surround the house. In, in grief recovery, there are things that surround our loss. So I might have this great big loss, but it's in context not only of recent events in my life, it's in context of my whole life. So we, it's a real key to grief recovery to put my loss in context so I can better understand myself. And it, it's pretty simple to do in one sense. Uh, but tonight or today, we're going to start with the P in CPR. The C is context. The P is permission. Have you ever thought something was wrong with you okay raise your hand if something if you've ever thought something was wrong with you well if you're an honest person unless you're just crazy or asleep i shouldn't say crazy unless you're asleep and if you're asleep you're not listening to this so most of us have felt have thought that at times there's something wrong you know what's wrong with me why do i feel this way why can't i get up and do something well you know so I love Charlie Brown. And if you don't know who Charlie Brown is, I feel really old, but I feel old anyway. Okay. I feel old anyway. But Charlie Brown is a comic strip character. He used to be in Charles Schultz, uh, started, I think, in the 50s. And uh, I used to collect all the Charlie Brown peanuts comic strips. Uh, they, they had books come out. I, had, I used to have about 20 of those books. And I should have kept them, I, I got them in the 70s. I bought like 25 of them over a period of time because it gave me such relief just to laugh and uh, should have kept them. They'd probably be worth tens of dollars today, right? But Charlie Brown was a character in the Peanuts comic strip and he was a loser in his own eyes. And there's one comic strip. It's just a one frame <laughs> comic strip and he's walking as this dark cloud over him and he's thinking, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Well, I have to battle those feelings like every other day or something. What is wrong with me? Uh, for those of you who know me, I like to talk. If you don't know me, I still like to talk. Uh, and sometimes I talk too much, and sometimes I say things I shouldn't say. Now, over the years, I've gotten better. But how many times have I thought to myself, what in the world is wrong with you, Matthews? And I even know my last name is one T, you know, and I call myself by the right name. What, what is wrong with me? In the grief world, when I've experienced loss, I guarantee you that most of the people that we work with in grief has thought, most of them have thought, what is wrong with me? And it, it's just, we've all felt that. Why? Well, because our hearts are broken. Grievers have broken hearts, not broken brains. I love that statement. I mention it all the time. So when I hurt because the dearest on earth is gone 
And it could be a child, a spouse, a, a friend, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father. The obvious horrific losses that are there it could be that. It could be non-death losses. It could be a husband or a wife that left you for another person. It could be uh, a lot of non-death losses. It could be dealing with a loved one who's dying. Maybe they have Alzheimer's or cancer and they're still alive. It, it could be your identity is just gone. Maybe maybe you had a career and now that career is over or you've, you've retired. It could be self-imposed and still feel like a loss. Uh, many people have lost their identity. Who in the world am I? When things are different in my life, whether I've retired or changed jobs or moved to a new city or a new place, I often experience grief and don't even label it as grief. So there are a lot of reasons why we... Uh, we ask what is wrong with me, but grief has that quality about it, and often grief is disguised. We had a friend who lost a, a daughter to suicide, and when they didn't know why, she took her life. And, you know, they had to know why. They not only missed her, they were thinking, well, there's something wrong with us. We weren't the best parents. We should have done more, and guilt sometimes overwhelms people. And so when they say what is wrong with me, it's often because they feel guilty and that guilt is unresolved. And so we had some friends who had a daughter that lo lo lost her life to suicide. She took her own life. And when they started on, on, on packaging this thing, and we call it, you know, taking off those layers uh, of what was really there, they found out their daughter had lost her identity. She did not know who she was anymore. And it, it wasn't a death loss until she took her life. And then, it, a, a, again, of course, it was the parent's death loss. But it was a non-death loss that, that sparked the grief in their daughter that led to her feeling hopeless and helpless. And in a, a, a moment, she ended her life. A sad story, but a real story. So what is wrong with me can be over a non-death thing a non-death loss as well. And then other people, other people, uh, you know, say that, you know, say crazy things that really hurt us. And uh, they, they might even mean well, but we lose somebody we love and we're really struggling with the loss because they meant so much to us. And then, and then we get a card in the mail and it's by some well-meaning person and they'll say, David, I want you to believe what I'm about to say. God won't give you more than you can handle. We're going to talk about that myth in a later podcast. Or they say something like, here's a scripture, and it says, be courageous and nothing be anxious, but in everything be uh, full of thanksgiving. And I love those passages. But when I'm in grief, when somebody tries to fix me, when somebody tries to fix me, I am insulted because I, it makes me feel worse because not only do I have the loss, now I've got how pathetic I am, and then here are these people trying to fix me. So when somebody's trying to fix you or fix me, they're basically saying, if you were as smart as me, you wouldn't feel so bad. Then I feel worse because now I'm a sorry griever. Not only do I have lost the most precious thing on earth to me, perhaps, but now I've done a bad job with that loss, so I must be weak in faith. And so... You go to church maybe six months after a loss. Maybe you don't want to be at church and you drag yourself to church or people expect you to be there. I had to go to church because I was a preacher, so it was pretty bad if I just decided to stay home, you know, one Sunday. And so when I was in grief, I had to preach. And so can you imagine some preacher saying, which I was one of those guys, those people or whatever preachers are, I was one of those. And I probably said this before, uh, Here's Sister Brown, and she loses her husband, and she's back in church on Sunday morning, like three days after the funeral. And I get up and say, you know, our hearts and prayers go out to Sister Brown, blah, blah, you know, la di da, la di da. And she is so full of faith. Look, she's back in her church pew just three days after losing her husband. What great faith. And here's somebody there that's in church maybe for the first time in six months. They've had a loss. They don't even want to be there. So now by implication, they're being told, they don't have a greatest faith that somebody's back in church immediately. So it just adds on. Something's wrong with me. Well, this podcast is labeled, There's No Fixing Allowed. Absolutely no fixing allowed in the grief world. 
and everybody, it seems, tries to fix. I try to fix you if you're in grief. I try to fix myself if I'm in grief. There must be something wrong with me, and so I make more efforts to fix myself, and the more efforts I make, the more I fail, the worse I feel, and the cycle continues, and I can find myself stuck in grief. So we deal with that all the time at Spark of Life. And so uh, when people give advice, and so one of the little uh, golden nuggets from this uh, podcast today is not only do not give uh, not only do not give up on your recovery, but give yourself permission to grieve. And this is the P in the CPR. But also, stop giving advice. And if you know somebody's in grief, quit trying to fix them. I need to try to stop trying to fix me when I'm in grief. Fixing just never works. So don't give advice to people unless they ask for it. Uh, Debbie and I, Debbie's my wife, and we've been married 46 years this past June, and uh, I used to give advice to Debbie. I used to be a really dumb husband. <laughs> Every time I gave her advice, I was telling her, if you're just as smart as me, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't feel so bad. Now, I didn't realize I was doing it, but intentionality doesn't always have to do, <laughs> you know, I can be well-intentioned and still hurt somebody, Right. But for years, I tried to give Debbie advice. She'd come home. I'd say, how'd your day go? She said, so-and-so didn't talk to me today. Uh, didn't talk to me at church. She passed me in the hallway. Uh, she treated me like garbage. Um, and I would, I would, you know, because I took psychology 101, and later I got a degree in counseling. So <laughs> I thought I really knew how to fix people, which is a joke, because I can't fix anybody. I can't even fix me. So I could, how could I fix you? But here I was, you know, giving, doling out advice free. I didn't charge my wife anything for my advice. I thought I was a pretty good guy. So, so and so didn't speak to me at church today. So you know what? I I would say something like this. Well, honey, maybe so and so had a really bad day, and maybe we should think through this that maybe it wasn't about you at all. Brilliant, right? No, not brilliant at all. A little bit dumb, maybe a lot dumb. <laughs> when I say things like that, said things like that to Debbie, without me realizing it, I was telling her there's something wrong with her. And if she could just be as mature and brilliant and wise, and yes, even spiritual as I am, then she would not feel bad. Well, I need to quit doing that. So we're privileged to work with an organization called Marriage Helper who tries to save marriages, and they're a great partner with Spark of Life. And uh, if you're having marriage problems and you really need a great website and a gr great programs, you go to marriagehelper.com. And uh, so we do these, these marriage workshops, which is so closely related to grief, and I, I don't want any jokes about that. I hear some of you snickering right now. No, there is a lot of similarities because there's a lot of grief in marriage. And I'm not joking about that because we're different people and we hurt each other. And so we do these workshops. So one of the things I say all the time is if you want a happy marriage, never, 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 never give advice to your spouse unless they ask you. And if they do ask you, give advice very carefully, very carefully. So I've, I've, I've come to realize that. Now I still struggle with that at times, you know, like three or four times a day, but it used to be 10 times a day. So Debbie now knows I do that and, and, and that I'm aware of it. So I've cut way down on it. And when I do that, I'm more apt to say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. And she says, yes, you shouldn't have said anything, but thanks for caring. So she handles it a lot better and I handle it better. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I like to talk to people on elevators. Anybody else like to talk to people on elevators? Well, we should get together on an elevator and talk if you like that. So uh, two or three times in my, our lives, we travel a lot, especially the last 10 years. And we travel so much. And so we're in these hotels. And there's one Saturday night, we come back to our hotel. And they're having this big party down below. And we get on the elevator and these two people, the, this young couple gets on the elevator. And it's just Debbie and me and this young couple. So I, I remember this very well. We're in Fort Worth, Texas right across from the Texas Motor Speedway in this 
big old hotel that we got cheap on Priceline. I tell you too much information, I think. And so this couple gets on there and I deduce because I, you know, I've got a degree in counseling and I'm so smart. And I say that sarcastically uh, that they're newly married. Of course, she's wearing a big, long white gown and he's in a tuxedo and there's a party down below. So I'm, I'm so, you know, deductive in my thinking. And I've done this three or four times. So I look at the guy and says, well, so y'all are newly married. No, buddy, we just always dress like this, right? Yes, we're newly married. And I say, well, my wife and I do marriage workshops. In fact, we're in town to do a marriage workshop. So I want to give you some advice. And I look at him and they think I'm crazy now. They just think I'm nuts. And I say to him, if you want a happy marriage, never, 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 never give this bride, your bride, advice unless she asked for it. And without question, the many times I've done this, two or three times in an elevator, but more times than not just out, you know, at an airport, talking to people, things like that. Every single time the wife, the woman, starts nodding her head like this and says, thank you for that advice. As I broke my own advice, right? Giving advice without being asked. In grief, you need to give yourself a break. Stop trying to give yourself and, and fix yourself. And grievers don't need fixing. They don't need advice unless they ask. What they need is to grieve. Permission to grieve. Permission to grieve. It is part of reviving that broken heart. You can never heal that heart totally. There's going to be scar tissue for many years. For a lot of us, till we die, there's going to be that scar tissue around our hearts, but it will not keep us from living forward with hope and purpose and joy. For a while it does because we're in deep, deep grief. That's normal. That's natural. I can't short circuit the process. I can't force myself not to grieve. The more I try not to grieve, the more deeper I sink because I'll stuff feelings and I'll have those feelings in there and I could have resentments, I could have regrets and not deal with that. And then I come out and it hurts other relationships. That's why it's important to have a healthy recovery. But I got to start with permission to grieve. I put my loss in context of my whole life and then I give myself permission to feel bad. And that means uh, that if that that permission needs to come whenever I, I want to just sit and cry, then I give myself permission to cry, even if it's a year after the loss or nine years after the loss. We had a young lady who lost her husband in a horrific, of course, accident. She was a young mother, had three young kids. And uh, she was taught, went to, came to one of our retreats about a year after her husband was killed. And uh, she was telling us on this point about uh, going to Walmart and going shopping for the first time since her husband had died and since the funeral. It was three or four weeks after the funeral. You know, people brought food over and all that. And she was telling us in the middle of Walmart, um, she reached for an item and the item she always bought for her husband because that was his favorite food. Nobody else liked it. So she picked up this item and put it in the basket without thinking. And she was getting it for her husband who had died like four weeks earlier, three or four weeks earlier. And she realized she didn't need that anymore. Trigger, unexpected. She tells the story that she sat down on the floor of Walmart and just started crying. She did not care what anybody thought or said. She didn't care. That's healthy. She gave herself permission to feel terrible. And so our grief advice <laughs> is don't give advice to those unless they ask. Well, you've kind of asked because you're on this podcast or you're listening to this or watching it. And the other thing is give yourself permission to have really bad days. Uh, Dennis and Terry are good friends of ours that help us do Spark of Life. They lost their daughter many years ago, nine years after Micah's death. Uh, Dennis was telling us one day at the retreat on this very subject about permission to grieve that uh, they had a speaker in chapel where he was a teacher in school and the speaker had, he had gone to college with and was talking about his daughter and things about his daughter who is now grown and, you know, married and having kids. And Dennis, that was a trigger for Dennis, an unexpected trigger because his daughter, who's about the same age as this guy's daughter, had died 
and he didn't have all that that this guy was talking about. And he just, nine years later, he walked out of that assembly and he went to his car and he just cried. That's permission to grieve. It doesn't mean you're in a bad recovery. In fact, it probably means you're in a healthy recovery. Recovery from loss is a messy thing. And I can't short circuit feeling bad. So I give myself permission. I go to a safe place. I talk to a safe person. I go by myself sometimes. I go and I share it with somebody. And that's what we do at Spark of Life. We want to walk beside those who are grieving when you need us. Use us. That's what we want. That's why we live. Uh, That's where we think God has led us to do. So permission. And the second permission is permission to recover. It is permission to recover. It is permission to laugh again. It is permission to get up and live again with my pain. The more I give myself permission when those sad days come, the more likely I will get up and wash my face a little quicker and go back and live because I have a lot to live for. And I'll I'll learn to laugh again. It might take a long time. There's no time frame. I can't give you an exact time frame. But I will give myself permission to live forward almost in the same breath that I give myself permission to grieve. And when those waves of grief come, I go with the wave. I let the wave take me where it needs to take me. And, and sometimes I wake up on the shore and I've got sand all over and I'm coughing and sputtering up water, but I'm on the shore. And what do I do? I don't stay on the shore forever. I finally get up and I go take a shower and I, I get the sand out of my nostrils and I get dressed and I live forward with that pain. I wish it was easier. I wish we we had it all easier for you. But there's no fixing allowed, right? Permission to grieve, permission to recover, and and to recover in a way that gives myself permission to have bad days, even years later. That doesn't mean I'm in an unhealthy recovery. A healthy recovery means that all my other relationships that are important to me, I'm not destroying because... uh, because I've given myself permission to live. And so the CPR of a healthy recovery, context and permission to grieve and permission to live life again, to smile again, to go play golf again, or to, or to go dancing again, or to, or to join some kind of group, or to go back to church again, and permission to live forward. And be thankful for what I have and don't be so focused on what I've lost. But for a while, all my focus is on who I lost. And that's called normal and natural. That's just what grief is. But as I get up, I start to, I still have the pain, but I start to think of others as well, like my family. And you're doing that right now. You just don't realize it. Most of you are living forward and, and don't even realize it. Maybe it's time to realize you are living forward with your pain. Permission to grieve. Permission to live forward. At Spark of Life, at sparkalife.org, we have so many things to offer you. Uh, our first virtual retreat's coming up in September 20th through 23rd or September 17th through 20th. It's on the website. It's going to be phenomenal because it, it is all our retreat stuff virtually online with Zoom. We will get to know you. Debbie and I are going to do those first few virtual retreats. We'll get to know you very well. Uh, we'll have three days with you. Uh, Go on sparkalife.org to see the offerings there. Uh, There's also grief coaching. We have certified grief recovery coaches standing by. Uh, You know, grieving alone is tough. Sometimes we need help. And uh, we have a grief online course you can take. Uh, We have a lot of offerings on there. We have a God and grief section about where is God in the midst of all this. For those of you who struggle with the God concept and why didn't he answer your prayers or didn't appear to answer them, all that stuff. At Spark of Life, We believe there's always hope, always hope to live forward. 